Well, thank you for joining us today for our online service. I'm glad that you're, that you're here and uh, we're going to be continuing to share with you from cover to cover as we go through all the books of the Bible. And it uh, won't necessarily be in continual sequence, but uh, so far it has been. And so today we're going to be talking about 2 Samuel. Last week uh, in 1 Samuel, you would have, um, I guess we introduced the whole idea of, of uh, the beginning of the 40-year reign of King David's uh, leadership over Israel. And 2 Samuel really uh, goes into the establishment of the Davidic uh, dynasty and the covenant that God made with King David. When you look at the first, chap- first 10 chapters of 2 Samuel, you're going to see all kinds of um, really good things happening. And, you know, there's victories and battles are being won and David's got lots of favor and people are happy with his leadership. We see the Ark of the Covenant returning home and David being so excited he dances before the Lord and his wife being embarrassed by him. Uh, Probably not the first and not the last wife to ever be embarrassed by her husband, but uh, all of these kinds of things are taking place. We see David's compassion for the poor and we see the the mercy part of of his leadership now it doesn't stop there you see the bible doesn't just talk about the good stuff the bible also is an open book to the the faults the foibles and the sins of people and david did not get a free pass there in fact uh, David did some very wicked things, and there's full record of it in the scripture in 2 Samuel. It's all kind of exposed and laid bare and talked about. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Um, we see on, on the news and we see on the internet when, when preachers fall. And, and this last year, there have been a number of them, actually. And... Uh, guys that have fallen to moral failure and sinned and there's great embarrassment and shame and all of that. But could you imagine having committed a sin and it's, it's put into this eternal document, the scriptures, the Bible, and it's just there for generations and generations and generations to, to read about, to learn from it, to talk about. Well, that's David right there. Um, they say you can't erase stuff from the internet. Well, this is right of the scripture. And it's there. Permanent record. And so, anyhow, I'm going to talk a little bit about David's error and David's sin. But what we do see, just before I go into that, is David <laughs> being exposed and repenting of his sin. And God being pleased with the position of his heart. He wasn't pleased about the sin that he committed, but he was pleased for the sorrow that he had over his sin. So let's talk about that repentance and sorrow that David exhibited in his, in his life. And so in order to go there, let's talk about what the actual incident was. It had to do with David and Bathsheba. David was supposed to be out with, with his army you know, the king's going to war. It was that time of the year. And rather than going out and supporting his, his uh, army, he stayed home and he was lounging around resting and happened to look out his window and sees this gorgeous woman taking a bath on her rooftop. She wasn't doing it to be on display. I don't believe that. It was where she was taking her bath. There would be a a good degree of privacy, I'm sure. So David sees this, and he lusts after her, and he wants her. So he sends for her. She comes to him. He sleeps with her. She becomes pregnant. She's a married woman. And her husband is in David's army, and he's off fighting battles for David. And this is what David repays that loyalty with. He takes another man's wife and sleeps with her and gets her pregnant. 
It was a pretty dark moment in David's leadership. It was a pretty dark moment, not just in his leadership, but in his personal life and, and in his relationship with God. It was a terrible thing he did. And God wasn't real happy with what he did. In fact, he revealed it to Nathan the prophet. Nathan the prophet then confronts David and uh, kind of paints this picture, tells a story of somebody who had much and he took from someone who had little and, and David's like enraged about this and says, you know, you got to deal with this guy. <laughs> Nathan looks at him and says, well, you're the man. You're the man. And not uh, you're the man, but you're the man. You are the guy. You are the guilty party. You are the guy who did this. And David was caught. He was ashamed. It was all exposed. It was all laid bare. <laughs> anyway, David goes on to write in Psalm 51, 1 to 4. And this is concerning the exposure of his sin, the confrontation that, that, Nath, that, uh, that Nathan had with him. And listen to what he said. He said, have mercy on me Accord, according to your unfailing love, according to your compassion, blot out my transgressions. And then he goes on to say, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sins, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before you. In other words, God sees it all. And against you, you only have I sinned and alone and done what is evil in your sight. And so God sees his repentance, he sees his heart, he sees the contriteness of his heart, the sorrow over his sin, and God forgives him and God's pleased with him. However, however, you know how, you know how when you, you do something wrong and, and even though you may be forgiven by God, there's all of this collateral damage for your wrongdoing, and, and you see it all the time, you know, uh, somebody cheats on their spouse and they may be forgiven, their spouse may even forgive them, but there could be this wake of trouble, you know, where the marriage actually, even though there's forgiveness, the trust is permanently broken, the bond is broken, and it may end up in a, a broken home, a broken relationship, and, and now you got kids being raised in a single parent family, and you know, one of the parents can't see the kids all the time. And, and you know, it goes on like that. Or, or you commit a crime, you go to jail, you do the time. And, and you might be forgiven by God, but you still have to pay for your crime. And that was kind of what worked out in David's life here. He was forgiven by God, but there were still consequences to what he did. Here's the first one. The baby that he and Bathsheba conceived died. He died. Um, he had a whole bunch of wives, right? So then he had all of these half brothers and half sisters um, in his family. One of his boys, Amnon, takes a liking to one of his daughters, Tamar, and wants her. So he rapes her. Well, that's bad. I mean, this is a really terrible thing. We got incest going on in the family. And Absalom, who is Tamar's brother, is so angry with, 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 um, with Amnon that he plots to murder Amnon for raping his sister Tamar and carries it through. And so now you've got adultery. You've got the death of a baby. You've got rape. You've got murder. You've got incest. You get all these things happening in David's family. And it was kind of all unleashed on his family as a result of him stepping out and doing this really wicked thing and committing adultery with another man's wife and getting her pregnant. And, and then also conspiring to have her husband killed so he wouldn't he wouldn't be uh, discovered or found out. I kind of forgot to throw that in there, but yeah, he did that too. <laughs> so David prays this prayer. Surely you desire truth in 
the inner parts and you teach me wisdom in the inmost place. And so what David is saying is, <laughs> you, see, you see who I really am, God. And you want me to be real and authentic because I could do these things, but I can't hide from you. You see it. You see what's in my heart. You see the inner workings of my heart and my mind, and you want truth there too. That's, that's what you call integrity, being completely whole, not only in what we do, but in who we are. You know, we as a nation have really been shaken to the core in the last few weeks, haven't we? There's been some discoveries made. Um, it's like the sheets have been pulled back. And we have a whole indigenous population that is, is hurt and grieving. And we as a nation feel naked and exposed and we feel ashamed and we're grieving together. Oh, and then you, you hear about somebody driving down a sidewalk and, and wiping out a whole family because they, they don't like their religion. It's all this hatred. And, 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 and we, we feel the pain of this as a nation. And I think that we're probably at a time. No, not probably. We're at a time when we as a nation really do need to get down on our knees before God and repent. Repent of our pride, our hatred, our arrogance, our sin. And we need to come clean before God, like David did. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love, according to your compassion. Blot out our transgressions. Wash away our iniquity. Wash our sins away, dear God. Because if God's going to do something new in your community, in our community, in your church, in my church, and in your family, in your home, in your life, it starts with us coming clean before God and saying, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We've acted arrogantly. We've acted wickedly. We have gone way off the rails, just like David did. I think we're at a time as a nation where we need to repent of our pride and our prejudice, prejudice, our hatred toward one another. And realize this, that God is merciful and forgiving. But I think now's the time to repent. And so I just want to leave that out there. And which brings me to another point here. And, and we see this story transitioning from David blowing it and, and the sins of his family and all the things that were going on to the establishment, the promise of the establishment of David's eternal throne, his eternal kingdom. And that was a promise actually spoken by God in, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, 16. And this is, this is the key verse that I want to emphasize today. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever, and your throne shall be established forever. And so this is a promise that, that God is making to David, that this is going to be an eternal throne. And so it's the beginning of what we were, would refer to as the Davidic covenant, the deal that God made with David. And, and so here's how it's lived out. David lives, he rules, he dies. His son, who is part of his lineage, Solomon, takes over and he becomes the king. So that's an extension of this kingdom. And then more ancestors and descend, I'm sorry, descendants would follow along and part of David's line be the king of, of, of Israel. But ultimately, the one who is in the lineage of David is Jesus Christ. And this is where the kingdom becomes eternal. It's through Jesus Christ. Jesus' kingdom is eternal. And if you're a follower of Christ, and you can be if you're not, you're part of the eternal kingdom of Jesus Christ. So let's talk about this 
eternal kingdom for a minute. Did you know that Queen Elizabeth has been on the throne for 69 years? At the time of my message today, it's been 69 years. The longest serving United States president is Franklin D. Roosevelt. And do you know how long he served? 12 years. The longest serving Canadian Prime Minister, William uh, Lyon Mackenzie King. You know how long he served? 21 years. And so what we see is, is kings and, and rulers and prime ministers and presidents, they all have these seasons where they can give leadership and be famous for a while and maybe be known for something. But the time goes really fast. They, they come and go. And there's someone else coming in their wake. And um, their time on the stage, their time to lead, their time to give influence, the time to, to be in charge is a season. It's a breath. It's a very short breath. Jesus' kingdom is forever. Jesus' kingdom is eternal. And so here's, here's a word to, to kings and prime ministers and presidents today. <laughs> if you're listening, I don't know that anybody would be. But listen, you're going to come up against the kingdom of God. You're coming up against an eternal kingdom, and you're going to come and go. But this kingdom is going to outlast every kingdom, every power, every ruler, every authority that's ever established in the world. When you're long forgotten, God's kingdom will remain. It will remain. So keep that in mind. No matter who you are, no matter how big you think you are, no matter how important you may think you are, God's kingdom is forever and ever and ever, and it will never end. Never ending. Revelation chapter eleven fifteen says, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And what does it say? and he will reign forever and ever. It's an absolute, genuine kingdom. It's the real deal. It's the real thing. And it unites every person on the globe who belongs to Jesus Christ as one holy nation. And that's why you can travel anywhere in the world and walk into a church with other believers and feel like you're part of the family. And be welcomed as though you're one of us. That's why. Because we're established as one holy nation under Jesus Christ and a kingdom that will reign forever. It's really quite something. Here's what else the Bible says. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. I love this. God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. <laughs> You're a holy nation, a royal priesthood, God's special possession, established in Jesus' kingdom that reigns forever and ever and ever and is established forever and ever. And it, you know what? It goes back to King David, way back there. So if you belong to Christ... You belong to an eternal kingdom. You know, there is a lot of people today that are wondering where they fit. They're wondering about who they are. What's my purpose in life? Why am I on this world? What's my true identity? Who am I? And I think that it could be said that our true identity is found in Jesus Christ. And we can, when we, when we come to know Christ and live for Christ and be in relationship with Christ, there's something that happens in us where we get this sense that, that I'm part of something. I, I'm part of God's kingdom. I'm, I'm, I'm part of this holy nation. I'm, I'm part of his royal priesthood. And, and I really am a special possession that, that he holds in his hands. I belong. 
and I'm part of something that's bigger than me, bigger than the latest thing in this world, bigger than, than the latest fad, bigger than the latest philosophy. I'm part of something that is eternal and everlasting and it's just not going to ever end. Hebrews 12, 28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and with awe. It's a spiritual kingdom. It cannot be put down. It cannot be torn down. It cannot be torn apart. It can't be, although it may be opposed by earthly forces, it can't be destroyed because it's forever and it's going to outlast every opposition that comes its way. You know, these, these earthly powers and, and, and whatnot, they can take down politicians and, and they can destroy thrones and they can destroy powers and they can th destroy kingdoms. They can destroy institutions and systems and governments and, and nations. They come, they go, they rise, they fall. And the kingdom of God has endured so much over the centuries. Satan has tried to oppose it. He's tried to destroy it. There have been attempts to crush it, to illegalize it, to banish it, to, to silence it. Bibles have been burned. Christians have been burned at the stake. They've been thrown in prison. They've been persecuted. Churches have been burned. They've been closed down. They've been illegalized. They've, mankind has tried to, to control them, to take them over, to put them to death. But here's the deal. The true kingdom of Christ is established forever and ever, and it will not be torn down by man. It is eternal. And I hear all kinds of news and stories of, oh, the church is in trouble and people aren't coming to church and the church has lost favor and, and the decline of Christianity in Western society is rapidly happening. And I take solace in the fact of what the scripture says, that his kingdom shall be established forever and ever. ever. It is an eternal kingdom that we're part of. And there may be waves, there may be trends, there may be good, there may be bad, but the fact of the matter is, it's endured, and it will endure, because it's Jesus' kingdom, and it's an eternal kingdom, and I want to invite you to be part of that kingdom, and to recognize, if you're part of that kingdom, what you're part of. Because it's everlasting. We ought to live without any fear of what's going to happen to God's kingdom. There's going to be op opposition. There's going to be decep de deception. There's going to be attempts to discredit it, to oppose it. There's going to be hatred projected against God's kingdom. But we need to remember that in the midst of it, we are in a kingdom that is, in a kingdom that is eternal and unshakable and forever. And we stand firm in that truth. We just stand firm. We need to also keep building. Keep building the kingdom. Don't be discouraged by external forces that may be coming against the kingdom, but keep building. He shall build a house for thy name. And not only was this talking about maybe the temple of the Old Testament, but we're God's house. And God is establishing us as living stones as part of that house. And we are quickened and consecrated as believers in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit. We are the temples of the Holy Spirit. We are the habitation of God through the Holy Spirit. He lives in us. He dwells in us. We are living stones, part of his kingdom, part of his house. And the kingdom continues to be built as individuals find their way into the kingdom. As individuals find their way into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you're, you're part of that building of this eternal kingdom that's going to reign forever and ever. It's an everlasting, there's an everlasting place for you in the kingdom, in the kingdom of heaven. 
So when the attacks come, when you feel downcast, when you feel run over by people, by attacks, by words, let your confidence be in the fact that you belong to an eternal kingdom. And these things are going to happen. They do happen. They happen all the time. But the kingdom's going to advance because according to what God says, his kingdom is unshakable. And I want to invite you to be part of that kingdom. How do you do it? Well, it's, it's simple. It's uh, recognizing our need of, of a Savior, Jesus Christ. Recognizing that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. <laughs> like David, we can repent of our sins. And like David, we can be forgiven of our sins. And like David, we can be people after God's own heart. Given a fresh start and a fresh chance. And then it's, it's determining that Jesus is my Lord. He is my Savior. I'm going to live for him. I'm part of this kingdom. And you can make that choice for yourself today. And it is your choice. It is your choice. It's completely your choice. Nobody else's. It's yours and yours alone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. And we thank you, Lord, that we can be part of something that's bigger than ourselves. I thank you, Lord, that we can be part of something that will last longer than our problems. That is something that is eternal. Is something that is unshakable. And when we enter into it, we're in it forever. Thank you for that, Lord. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would enable people who are listening, if they're not part of that kingdom yet, to, to step into it and to know you as, as their own personal Lord and Savior. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you for joining with us and being part of our online service. We got more for you next week. And uh, next week is, I think it's Father's Day already. Um, we got more for you. And we look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Thanks, Pastor Jim, for another great message. And if you have anything that you would like to follow up with us on, if you have any questions or um, you want to know more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus or need a prayer request to be submitted or whatever, um, you can contact us through clcwinnipeg.ca and you can find links to our, uh, our contact or to our social media if you want to follow us on there or if you'd like to listen to past sermons or give or whatever it is you want to do. It's all on our website. We hope you have a great week. Thank you so much for joining us and God bless you as you go.